Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to a new session, a new week. Uh, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Uh, could one of us lead us in prayer? Mangi, if you're there, can you please lead us in prayer? Yes, Pastor. Go ahead. Holy Father, we thank you for this morning, Father. We give you all the glory. We, we just want to say we, we are grateful, Lord, for keeping us for over this weekend and bringing us here to, together again, Lord, so that we, we may learn your history, the history of the church, how you everything begin and where you are taking us, Lord. We pray that you open our mind, you you prepare our heart, and you empower Pastor Paul, Lord, as, as it teach, Lord. In Jesus' name, Father, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mangi. Okay, uh, so before we go ahead, let's just do a quick review of uh, what we did uh, last week. So last week we looked at the third great awakening and uh, we looked at how the revival spread from North America, went on to different parts of the world. And we looked at the lives of uh, revivalists and missionaries whom God raised up uh, during this time uh, to continue this outpouring over the years. So what happened from the first great awakening moved on into the second great awakening, moved on into the third great awakening. So uh, from what we studied last week, we looked at a few of them just to uh, refresh our minds. Charles Finney, uh, the modern day evangelist, the father of modern evangelism. We looked at how he uh, came up with this whole aspect of altar call and uh, a public invitation uh, to receive Christ as their personal savior. So wherever Charles Finney went, thousands of people came. Many lives were touched. Many lives were transformed, uh, uh, especially in America. And then out of that, uh, the, the, the outpouring went into England again, into Scotland. Uh, Edward Irving, uh, we studied about him, how uh, his, he had just 50 people in his church and it grew to 1,000 people just in a, a matter of few months. Uh, but one of the things he emphasized was uh, flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, that everyone, uh, you know, every believer uh, is empowered by the Holy Spirit to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, to exercise um, the gifts of the Spirit. So we saw that, uh, you know, even lay people began to, uh, you know, flow in the gifts, minister to people. So it was no longer, uh, you know, only the pastor should say this or only the missionary should say. And then, you know, so things started to change. And that's when the charismatic outbreak uh, began in the early 1800s. Uh, then we looked at George Mueller, a man of prayer, a man of faith, how he, God called him to minister to orphan children and how God supernaturally provided for him uh, and for the people in the orphanage. Then we also looked at uh, uh, revival uh, into uh, China, we looked at revival with David Livingston going into Africa. And uh, so we see that, you know, this it's so wonderful to see how God lays into people's hearts, different nations, right? Uh, some people said, okay, I'll go to Scotland. Some people said, I'll go to America. Some said uh, China and Africa and Europe and different parts of the world. It's so wonderful to see the hand of God during an outpouring, right? Uh, there was no place that the gospel was not reached, right? Uh, we also read, we studied about how, they, you know, uh, uh, people came to India, to Sri Lanka, to Burma, right? Uh, uh, and, and so wonderful, William Carey came to India and he, he did such a powerful work, such a lasting impact that even now um, his name is... Uh, you know, on many stones in our nation. So, uh, so it's so wonderful that you know these these revivalists, these missionaries that God used, uh, is, is, is that you know He used them 
in different ways and different styles and different aspects uh, yet with one cause to build uh, the kingdom of God so we will continue we will look on to uh, a few more missionaries and evangelists and uh, people that God used and and also what we will do is towards the end of this uh, session uh, we may not go go through each and every revivalist because that's too many but we will look at what is important and then towards the end of the session we'll pick up a few key observations from all that we have learned right okay so i'm on page 47 uh to if you're tracking along on the notes uh we're going to look at another man another missionary a great missionary his name is hudson taylor now uh he, hudson taylor was a missionary to china now many of us uh you know the the name hudson taylor itself should remind us of uh, china because hudson taylor was probably about at the age of 21 he left his homeland went into china now he was somebody who was uh, you know very uh, zealous in his uh, you know missions and the way to reach out to people so uh, very quickly he adapted to the chinese culture he started wearing those chinese clothes growing a pigtail uh, and you know he began to uh, uh, you know be along with the chinese right he began to behave like them he began to uh, talk like them he began to learn the language of course uh, many of them made fun of him of course they have different pro uh, protestants and different missionaries had gone to china during that time and so these other missionaries started making fun of hudson taylor why, why is he dressing up like them he can just share the word uh, but uh, that did not deter Hudson Taylor. He uh, he began to take the gospel into the interior villages of China. Uh, he went into the Hongpao River uh, and he began to evangelize. Now, one of the things that he would do was he would stand on this uh, riverbeds, right, uh, where where people would come to, uh, you know, refresh themselves, to uh, you know, to freshen up themselves. So he would stand there and he would begin to give out tracts and begin to preach the gospel. And um, it is said that when uh, Hudson Taylor stood and preached, it was like hundred microphones, you know, speaking at one time. It was, it was like so strong his voice was would cut through people's hearts and uh many people the chinese many of them gave their lives to christ uh, but what happened was uh he had to go back to america to uh you know to because of an illness to get to recover from that illness he went back and when he went back, he did not just sit around, do nothing, but he found founded a whole organization called the China Inland Mission. And that mission is continues even till this day, right? Uh, it has a different name. It's called Overseas Missionary Fellowship. Uh, but what he started, the China Inland Mission, uh, what, what it was, was uh, uh, he would encourage people, if you want to serve the Lord, uh, join the China Inland Mission, they go into China, and they are not supported. They are not given any financial help. Uh, all of them live by faith. But here's the thing. Uh, uh, even though all of these facilities were not there, 23 missionaries joined. Out of, after, a few, after a few months, uh, you know, that kept increasing. There were about 102 missionaries uh, sent out into the whole of China. And so imagine this. Just picture this. One man right went preached in china uh, for a couple of years came back started this organization hundreds of people missionaries came in they went deep into the you know towns villages of china sharing the gospel of jesus christ um, it is said that you know hudson taylor was a man of uh, enormous physical and mental strength Right. Uh, so his team members would find it difficult to even keep up with him because his his leadership style was so effective, high ideas, his worth ethics were very high, spiritual fervor, his trust in the Lord was very high. And so, uh, you know, some of his team people would say, if Hudson Taylor is coming, we will come in the next mission, the next journey. You know, they wouldn't want to go with him. Of course, they they love to go on missionary journeys and minister the gospel they didn't want to go with him because he was 
so fervent uh, and very hard to keep up with his lifestyle. So, um, but through all the zeal and fervor, uh, you know, uh, Hudson Taylor went through a very difficult time as well. He lost his wife. Um, he lost his children, uh, many of them before the age of 10. He had a physical and a mental breakdown early 1900s. But uh, again, the work, uh, China England Mission continued to take the gospel uh, into China. And uh, and that organization still does it even right now. So um, Hudson Taylor is, we would say, uh, left a very prominent mark uh, in in China and through his China England mission and many people began to adapt his style uh, where you know he would they would wear the Chinese clothes dress up like the Chinese sit with them eat with them uh, and then so what happened was it became a missionary style for the China England mission team because a lot of people ridiculed him first but then after that they realized that he did the most impact among everyone else and so they began to take to his method of ministry of course it was not about the clothes it was not about his style but it was about the anointing of the holy spirit upon his life right so from then we go on to uh, another place uh, this is in new york now many of us may ha have heard of this it's quite a popular uh, uh, event that happened in church history. It's called the Layman's Prayer Revival. So in America, what happened was business was booming. Things were getting back to normalcy after the wars and all of that. Uh, and the lay people, right? Uh, so actually, there were. Uh, if you see the, if you study about this, uh, we will talk about this later as well. Two two friends. Uh, they were working in an office, but they were burdened in their heart to pray, right? So these two, two or three friends, they sat together in the afternoon during their lunchtime in the middle of their work, um, said we would pray, uh, spend about 30 minutes in prayer. So they did that. Uh, the prayer meeting had about six people. In a matter of months, that prayer meeting grew to 10,000 people. Just a few months. Now, there is no pastor. There is no missionary. There is no ministry. Nothing. Right? Uh, it moved on to 10,000 people. It spread all across America. Over 1 million people would sit in the afternoon time during their work hours. You know, take a break of half an hour. Sit and pray all across America. I can you picture this? What started with two to five people went on to become 10,000 people. Right? How did they manage this? We don't know. But this 10,000 people, this movement of prayer reached out all of America. So basically it was like this. Hey, they, they are praying in the afternoon at 12 o'clock. Uh, just an example, right? Uh, they're praying at 12 o'clock in the afternoon in this place in new york so we also should do this so people from different parts of america began to follow that same timing and they were just lay people people who were ordinary working class people and out of this the layman's revival became like a revival that brought thousands of people to christ and it went on into europe it went on into scotland britain germany netherlands west indies south africa all these countries uh, uh, began to have their afternoon times of prayers and this went on for about two years or more um, but eventually uh, when we study what happened after that was uh, you know uh, an organization was formed a structure was formed uh, which led to a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, and slowly this layman's revival uh, began to die out uh, because of all the you know structures and forms that was involved. But uh, we must remember the fact that hundreds and thousands of people came to Christ through this layman's revival. So we will study a little more on this later on as well. Uh, after this, revival continued to spread. Uh, uh, another place was Northern Ireland, where 
you know, God used four young men. Uh, I won't name them because we may not remember it itself. So about these four young men to just have times of prayer. Right? Uh, so basically meet at a place, sit and pray. Right? So he would, uh, they would call it prayer consults, like we've mentioned before. Uh, now, through these, through these four people, uh, the, the, you know, the whole prayer movement began to grow. All of a sudden, there were 1,000, there was 2,000, there was 10,000 odd people, uh, you know, giving their lives to Christ. How? Just through a prayer, right? There was no preaching of the word, just prayer. People would come uh, into these places. They would stand in the rain. They would stand in the mud and they would, you know, weep and cry out to God. Uh, they were they fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, right? And what happened after a while? There was lay people preaching uh, the word of God, but it is said that during these times, people could not go up the stage to preach because the conviction of the Holy Spirit was so much they felt that hey, we are not worthy to speak this word, and so they would be on their knees, they would cry out conviction of their sins, they would cry out. Uh, tears would stream down their face and uh, you know there, there, there was a factory uh, factories in the towns and villages were shut down because workers were sitting in the prayer meeting and in the prayer meeting they're convicted they're not able to get up and go and uh, continue their work and homes and families were restored marriages were restored children were brought to the Lord uh, uh, whiskey and alcohol trade was was almost closed down uh, and pubs were closed down uh, the police had no work to do the judges had no cases and the whole of this northern island scotland began to see a revival it is said that more than 100000 people joined churches due, through this revival I picture this just like the layman's revival two people started it here as well four people started it what was it a, 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 a something birth in the spirit uh, to pray for the people right now i always say this uh, and i always think about this something that is born of the spirit the result will be a work of the spirit and a work of the spirit will, it will always bear fruit Right? There's something that is born of the flesh will result in the work of the flesh. Right? And, and what is the work of the flesh will not bear fruit in God's kingdom. Right? Now, I think it's next year you will learn about uh, world religions and contemporary cults. Uh, and we look at how these cults were formed. It was only to satisfy their own desires. Uh, they were genuine people, genuine ministers of God who really wanted to do something for the Lord, yet a desire to start something of their own, uh, a fleshly desire, caused them to go astray from the work of God. But it's so wonderful to see this. Uh, God uses just even the lay people, just a moment of prayer, uh, four or five people joining together with a burden, praying for the city, praying for lost souls, and God answered their prayers. The same way revival went into Scotland, into England, the churches, whether they are Methodist, whether they are Presbyterian, whether they are Anglican, whether they are uh, Baptist, whatever it was, Pentecost, all the churches began to see rise in attendance. They said that over, over 650,000 people were saved across England. So obviously, so many people saved. People were, you know, entering into churches. Um, it is said that, you know, uh, for an 8 p.m. service, people would come at 5 p.m. directly from work and stand so that they can get a place inside the tent. Now, we must understand that they did have auditoriums at that time, uh, but when we say auditorium, it didn't mean like a, or you know, not always was it in a physical 
structure like the auditoriums we have now, but it's more of a bigger tent, right? Um, um, bigger seating facility uh, with tents uh, put in. So um, Scotland saw 300,000 people saved. Uh, so just an amazing work. Um, uh, and, and it's interesting to see that this revival that, you know, uh, uh, this move that started in the first great awakening, God did not let it die down. The moment it was dying down, right, God used somebody to, you know, uh, rekindle that revival spark, right? And, and, and so we see many, many lives changed. Then we look at another man named Charles Spurgeon. Now, as a Christian, I'm sure all of us may have heard of this name, Charles Spurgeon. He is known as the Prince of Preachers. He was a pastor of a church uh, congregation. Uh, uh, he was born in England. Uh, he was known... His reputation was of a great preacher. His, the way he preached, um, the way he would, uh, uh, you know, with a lot of zeal, with a lot of enthusiasm, he would preach. Uh, and so many times they would invite him. Uh, though he was from a small church, he pastored a small church, the church began to grow. But they would invite him to many places to preach. Why? Because, uh, because of his whole style of preaching. He was really uh, zealous for God. And, and he said that when Charles Spurgeon spoke, uh, uh, you know, there, was, there were times when uh, the neighboring villages would, uh, you know, uh, close down their... Uh, pubs and uh, all these, uh, you know, the uh, wrong things that evil works that were happening. People would be convinced they would close it down and sit at home uh, because, okay, Charles Spurgeon has come, he's preaching, and uh, we can't do any, we'll not have any business anyway. So they would actually wait if there was a meeting for about one week. They will wait, they will shut down their businesses, wait for seven days, wait for him to go, and then they will try to you know, open his, uh, open their business again. So there was such a fear uh, for the, you know, for this man of God. Uh, uh, the church began to grow. Uh, Charles Spurgeon began to speak into, in many places, thousands of people came. Uh, he was invited to preach across the world. Uh, uh, he was very dramatic in his style of preaching. His sermons were also, um, you know, published in newspapers, the New York Times and London Times had his sermons published. Um, and, and so he did a wonderful work uh, also, uh, Charles Spurgeon. And then we look at D.L. Moody. Uh, D.L. Moody was an evangelist and uh, uh, he was known for his, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, th that fervor for Christ, meaning he, he said, God, give me one soul every day, right? At least one soul every day. Uh, very prominent evangelist. Uh, Moody, he started off as a, a shoe salesman, right? So he would uh, he would work in a shoe, say he was a shoe shop, at a shoe shop. Uh, he was a shoe salesman. He would also go door to door. Uh, but what he would also do was during his Sundays, he would teach the Sunday school class and uh, uh, and then he served at the local YMCA, Young Men's Christian Association. Uh, so he began to do this. He he worked uh, on, you know, at the shoe shop, and then he would, uh, you know, be a Sunday school teacher. Now, at the Sunday school class, many children began to accept the Lord, right? So slowly he left his shoe business, and Moody began to serve in missionaries, serve... Uh, he began to, you know, um, reach out to many children. Eventually, he was ministering to children. And then later on, some some other believers came and told him, you are so talented. Uh, why are you focusing only on children? Why don't you, you know, uh, start a church and uh, let, the, uh, let many people be added into your church? And, you know, you can do a good job as a pastor as well. So he was quite, uh, you know... Uh, uh, I would say he was not too keen to start a church, but because they advised him, so he did it. He started a church. The church grew to about 5,000 people in just a couple of months uh, uh, because what he would do was he would 
go out on the streets every day. He would spend hours, uh, you know, preaching uh, the word of God, getting people to believe in Jesus. It is said that, you know, D.L. Moody would not sleep unless he, you know, uh, shares the gospel and sees at least one person. So there was this one day he was at work, I mean, you know, ministry, evangelizing, and he came back to his home. He laid down, very tired, he laid down. But as soon as he laid down, he said, today, not one of them, you know, uh, was able to give their life to Christ. So he was not, even, uh, even though his body was physically tired, he said, not one of them, so he was unable to sleep. He was rolling around the bed. And then he said, he woke up and he said, God, I cannot sleep unless you give me one person who will uh, hear this and accept this gospel. Uh, and he began to, you know, uh, declare those verses saying that the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And uh, he was tossing around the bed and uh, he came to his window and he was sitting that night. Uh, and as he was sitting there, he looked down and there was a man waiting uh, near the bus stop, uh, you know, waiting for a bus to go. And uh, it was late in the night. And so he thought, OK, why is this man waiting so you know for a bus at this time of the night so he went down uh, he said uh, so you're waiting for a bus uh, why don't you come up because I, the buses will not come uh, you can stay here and you can go tomorrow so he invited that man up he preached the gospel to him he prayed and he that other man accepted christ as his personal savior and um, you know the story goes on that 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 man was a very influential man in the government uh, uh, sector and so he did a lot of work uh, you know uh, and he says later on but because of dl moody uh, i've been able to you know be in the ministry so so we see that dl moody had such a passion for souls he went into colleges, uh, student volunteer teams, student, uh, you know, uh, prayer groups, all of that he started. And uh, uh, he's known as one of the most powerful evangelists. D.L. Moody was, you know, uh, when you look at him, he was a very short, stout ma man and uh, very unimpressive. But the moment he would open his mouth and preach, people would fall on their knees. Uh, because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, so I know we talked about this before. So it is not about our looks, our physical appearance. It's not about our eloquence of speech. It's not about, you know, what are the good, what are the words we use in a prayer? Is it sounding good? Or what are the words we use while preaching? Uh, is, 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 is the way I speak well? Is my intonation good? Is my tone good see all of this has its place right it has its place we have to you know improve ourselves and all of it but the main thing is that drives each one of us towards revival towards an outpouring of god should be the work of the holy spirit right? all these people uh, he was just dear modi was just a shoe salesman he was not maybe he was not even uh very well educated as compared to the others, but God used him as a mighty evangelist. Right? God looks at availability more than talent. Right? So, so D.L. Moody did a wonderful, wonderful work in America, which spread on into Europe and South Africa. Then we'll go into another person. Uh, her name is Mary Slessor. Now, Mary Slessor was, uh, at the age of about 28, was a Scottish woman. Uh, and she left England. She actually wanted to go into China, but uh, they could not. Uh, she thought, OK, I can't go there. Uh, but she then she said, OK, I will follow the footsteps of David Livingston. So she said, I'll go to the Ifik tribe of, uh, of the Calabar region. So she goes there. and. The people uh, had something interesting there in uh, the Calabar uh, region there. I'm not sure if any of our friends uh, from Africa are aware of this, but what happened was during those times, the Calabar people believed that if you have twins, one is from God 
uh, and uh, one is from the devil. And so what they would do is they would believe in this practice of killing the twins at their infancy itself. Uh, so this practice for went on for thousands and thousands of years, generation after generation. Um, so what Mary Slessor did was he, she focused on evangelism. She said, you know, this is wrong. Um, this is what uh, you know, children are a gift from God. And she would take care of orphans, native children. She began to promote uh, women's rights, establishing social change, education, government, all done by a 28-year-old woman. 28 years old. No credentials at all. She said, I want to do, do, you know, follow the footsteps of David Livingston. So she was able to abolish this whole thing of infant, uh, uh, you know, killing of twin infants. Uh, she abolished that, started orphanage homes, started uh, a school, started women's rights. She would go to the, you know, Mary Slessor, if we read about her, it's very interesting. She was a very tiny girl, right? Very tiny and... Uh, uh, very thin, right? Uh, very unimpressive in the sense that she would, uh, you know, the way she would talk. It is said that she would uh, mutter words, and uh, because of her accent, which is a Scottish accent, it's it's not many people could understand what she was saying in her. Uh, 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 and so uh, Mary Slessor was very, very, you know, like a weak. They would say that, uh, you know. Uh, uh, history says that they used to call her a duckling, right? Uh, meaning she was so weak and uh, thin and tender. But it is also said that when she would go to the government offices, people would make way for her, right? People would stop their work and look at the needs of her, of Mary Slessor. It is said that Ma when Mary Slessor enters a government office, all the work stops. And they would focus on her. What a what an anointing, right? Such an unimpressive girl from Scotland coming into Africa. Maybe, you know, many of them thought, okay, who, what can she do? She did a wonderful work. She abolished this, uh, you know, whole thing of uh, killing infancy. That did so much in Africa. Say he says she stopped in my home country too. Okay, so your home country is uh, Calabar. Uh, say. No, my home country is Nigeria. She she okay. was a missionary in Nigeria also. She okay. Killed of twins in Nigeria also. Okay, so it was even in Nigeria this whole thing of killing of twins. Oh yeah, the twins were being killed. It was like a taboo back then when they saw twins. So hmm. God used that to stop the killing of twins in Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the God, British yes. Were, were the colonial masters. So I guess that was how she was able to come through the British, uh, yeah. uh, the colonial masters the back then. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. she, she was used to stop the killing of twins in Nigeria too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sayi, for sharing that. Yes. So, uh, yes, it was a practice, but she was able to, you know, stop that from happening. And again, she, she did many other works as well, uh, orphanages, women's rights, establishing social change in Africa. So she did leave her mark in Nigeria, West Africa. Right. Uh, let's look at uh, the next person. Now, this next person, his name is William Booth. Now, many of us may have heard of this uh, group called the Salvation Army, right? William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. He was a Methodist preacher. And uh, the focus for uh, William Booth was to bring the gospel to the poorest and the most needy people, right? Including alcoholics, prostitutes, criminals. And so... That's why he called it the Salvation Army. And uh, this whole time, during his, this time, uh, uh, William Booth was, as a, as a young boy, he, uh, this is not in your notes, but as a young boy, he wanted to join the army. He was always uh, impressed by the way the army uh, was so diligent and so uh, so well organized. And, and so, uh, but then he could not, so he went on to, 
become a preacher. Uh, he established this whole Salvation Army in 58 countries. He wrote extensively. He composed many songs. It is said that, you know, the Salvation Army uh, said that they would, um, they would, uh, I'm sure most of us may have seen this uh, march past that, you know, uh, they would have like different, uh, you know, maybe in school we did that, you know, different houses or different, uh, uh, you know, groups would march in unison. So William Booth did that, right? He would, all the volunteers, all of them, they would march, uh, they would carry a flag of uh, uh, the cross, with the, seeing the flag, it's just a flag. And in between that is a cross, something like the medical, uh, not the new medical sign, but just a regular cross. And it is said that when they carried the, you know, uh, flag and marched across the city in, in within the city, uh, people, uh, you know, who ran prostitute centers, people who were uh, drug addicts, people who were uh, running drug cartels and uh, criminals, pubs, bars, all these places, they would shut down because William Booth is leading his people uh, in the city of uh, within the city of England and it's also said that you know the the person who is in, they would carry the flag there were times that, that that flag people would you know somehow go under that flag and they would be healed right uh, uh, people who had sicknesses they would uh, now we don't know the authenticity of it but this is what history said that you know uh, something like peter shadow how peter shadow just went over people and they were healed uh, same with the flag when it you know the we, we i'm not sure if it's the shadow of the flag or, or how people went under the flag but uh when people came across that uh, many of them were healed and many fell in the conviction of the holy spirit right there on the road uh, on the streets and uh, they would repent and uh, you know uh, save, be saved uh, so that was the work of william booth uh, again william booth was uh, a man with a gruff voice he was an elderly man uh, he had a gruff voice uh, people said that when he spoke the the walls would you know shake it was very gruff and uh, not pleasing to the ear at all but when he spoke uh, people were you know so convicted of the holy spirit uh, that you know they would say that nobody wanted to meet him you know because if you meet him uh, you know he'll convict you of your sins so in a sense in a good way people didn't want to meet him but uh, uh, and then he he did many works, uh, especially in America, in England. Uh, the Salvation Army grew to 56, 58 countries, uh, and many groups were formed uh, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, any questions, any thoughts any of us have? I know I've been talking, I've been going on. Uh, any thoughts, any questions? Uh, is it uh, is it something that we all are being encouraged with? Uh, uh, something that we're all, you know, taking things from these people's lives, these missionaries. I, everything okay? Okay. All right. So shall we continue? All right. Okay. All right. So from then on, uh, we see another person named C.T. Studd. Now, C.T. Studd was an English cricketer uh, who gave his heart to Christ. Uh, now, how he came to know of Christ was C.T. Studd was, uh, uh, you know, listening to D.L. Moody preach. And as he listened to D.L. Moody preach, he was stirred in his heart uh, that, hey, I want to share the gospel. Right after he accepted Christ, so he left uh, an inheritance that he has already on him. One, he left that. He left the, uh, you know, the pleasures of, you know, during those times, if you're on a, you're on a cricket team, uh, uh, and 
you know, you have benefits, right? You have luxuries, you have uh, uh, money, you have fame and all of it. He left all of that. Uh, and he said uh, he went to Hudson Taylor as a missionary to China. He let go of all his inheritance. And actually all of his inheritance, he gave it to George Mueller. Remember the man who had an orphanage uh, with uh, over 300, 400 children who lived by faith, a man of prayer. So C.T. Studd gave all his uh, inheritance to George Mueller. And he said, I will live, uh, I will depend on the Lord for everything. He served as a missionary. He went into China. We worked with Hudson Taylor. And then from there, uh, he went into India. He came into Africa. And uh, there's this uh, interesting quote that he says. Uh, uh, he says, some wish to live within the sound of the church. But I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard from hell. Right? Some wish to be near the church. Uh, but I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard from hell. Meaning, he was just trying to say that uh, I want to bring people out of the hands of death into the hands of Christ. Um, and so he... he he wrote this great poem, uh, Only One Life Twill Soon Be Passed. Uh, what a dedication. A cricketer, talented man, uh, you know, uh, had a good inheritance. <clears throat> Let all of that go. Said, I will depend on the Lord. Went into China, went into India and Africa. Now we must understand all these three places, China, India, Africa, uh, you know, are during those times would have been very, you know, very minimal development. Even in India, imagine in the 1800s, uh, how India would have been uh, in the villages and towns. Uh, it would have been such a task. Imagine China, imagine Africa. Um, but they let go of all the pleasures, all the comforts for the sake of the gospel. Right? He was very, very passionate about souls. And so, uh, it is said that when C.D. Studd uh, uh, came into India, uh, you know, he, of course, cricket was not very well known, but uh, through through this whole, through cricket, he also brought uh, many lives to, to Christ. So uh, he never forgot his passion. It is said that even at his older age, he would spend time uh, reading about cricket and, uh, you know, but it was not his main goal, right? Uh, his main goal was to bring souls to Christ. And and then we look at another young woman named Amy Carmichael. Now, Amy Carmichael uh, was a missionary to India, right? Uh, Amy began by volunteering in China, in the China-England mission. Again, she was refused to, uh, you know, her application was refused for the China-England mission uh, because she had health uh, reason so uh, so uh, Amy Carmichael spent two years in Japan and in Sri Lanka. Then she came to South India and spent the next fifty five years serving in India. Uh, so her primary work was establishing orphanages, and then eventually she rescued. Uh, these orphanages were rescuing uh, young girls who were forced into temple prostitution. And later on, even boys were welcomed into the orphanage. And uh, during her work, uh, she wrote many books. She wrote many songs. And uh, uh, somebody asked her, what is missionary like for you, Mary Slessor? Uh, sorry, Amy, uh, what, is your, what is missionary like for you? And she answered, missionary is a simple chance to die for Christ. Uh, it's an opportunity, a chance to die for Christ. That was her answer. Again, Amy Carmichael was, you know, she had many health problems. She was as thin as a stick. I don't know. Uh, if you go to Google, you may find a few pictures of her and just so thin and tiny. Uh, you know, uh, she would wear the Indian saris during those days. And, uh, you know, she would walk about in her orphanage. 
it is said that just like Mary Slessor, uh, you know, during those times, there were, you know, you know, there was a lot of, you know, obviously there was persecution. Um, you know, India had a lot of hin Hinduism was a prominent uh, religion, and so people would come, and uh, you know, there was a time when they planned to get Mary Slessor to go to a place, and during the way they would kill her, right? And so the plan worked out well, so she. Uh, had to go someplace as she was traveling about uh, they said that about 10 8 to 10 goons like they came and uh, you know tried to uh, they surrounded her and tried to uh, kill her but the the people who tried to do that they looked at uh, Amy Carmichael and said we could not even go near her uh, and so the moment she just stood there, she said, uh, I'm going for some work. The Lord is sending. She just began to speak. The people, the people who came to kill her fell under conviction of the Holy Spirit and they gave their life to Christ. Right? And she was just standing there praying for them. And then they all went home. And one of those people who came to kill her uh, was a, quite an influential Hindu who lived during those times and uh, uh, he donated several pieces of land uh, for Amy Carmichael's missionary work. And so yeah, it is said that, uh, uh, you know, she had angelic looks. She looked like an angel, right? She would always wear uh, a sari. She looked like an angel, but to the radicals, she looked, she was like a terrifying a person who who had the power of God. So those who, uh, you know, the radicals, those who were against her, could not even speak against what she was doing. Uh, you know, just think about it. Young, small girl, tiny girl, uh, and growing up in this place in India, uh, yet uh, so powerful that uh, her work still continues. The missions, the orphanages, um, they have a different name, of course, uh, uh, but the work still continues. Amy Carmichael. You can read. You can. Uh, you can I, I'm not sure, but you can check on Google. I'm guessing there are some pictures of a very thin uh, girl, very angelic looks. Yet, you no, know, the radicals, the people who who were against her, had no chance in front of her. Uh, it is said that she would spend hours in prayer, and when she would come out of the prayer room. Uh, you know, it is said that demons, you know, uh, these are all what people uh, wrote about her. They said that demons would begin to run away from people uh, the moment she would come out of the prayer room. Uh, such a powerful work. And uh, Amy Car Carmichael, again, left a lasting impact on missions in India. Um, finally, just the last one, uh, Ida Scudder. Again, another woman, uh, a third generation. If you remember John Scudder, he was a medical professional and he came to India, Dr. John Scudder. Uh, he wanted to start a, you know, a medical college, a medical uh, a hospital, and through that, bring in the gospel. And so uh, Ida Scudder was the third generation from uh, John Scudder. So she, again, had no desire for missionaries for mission work, uh, but she graduated graduated from a medical college. And uh, after graduating, she went back to New York, but something in her heart said, you got to do something, right? You have to do something for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, the gospel and uh, for the talents that God has given you. So she finally decided, okay, I'll go to South India. She came to South India. She started a small dispensary, uh, a clinic for women. Right, uh, because during those times, women would go through uh, pregnancies, and uh, you know, uh, of course, India had a lot of uh, you know diseases, and uh, there was no medical aid during that time. So she went. She started a small dis dispensary. Uh, then she started a school for girls, and that school. Then she started a medical college for people, and the medical college moved to a 200-acre land in uh, Velour, right? And uh, so this 200 acre land has a hospital, a, a college and housing for uh, students, boys and girls. Uh, Ida Scudder 
started the those from India will know this the Velour Christian Medical Center, very commonly known as CMC Velour. Uh, it is one of the largest Christian hospitals in the world. And uh, the CMC Velour uh, Medical School is the most uh, premier medical college in India. And the main, you know, the main objective of the people, even now, is not money making. Uh, but it is about spreading the love of Christ. A lot of their facilities are high-end facilities, uh, yet they serve the people with very minimal uh, cost. At some places, uh, it's even free of cost. Uh, and so uh, CMC Velour is, is, done, is even now doing a great work in our nation. People come from all over the nation, uh, to CMC Velour, uh, uh, and because of their 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 prayerful attitude, because of what uh, uh, how they you know they treat their patients as well. So, uh, Ida Scudder, one thing that we can learn from her is she did not want to do missions, right? She was not interested in it, uh, but God called her. What a wonderful way, young girl just graduated from medical college comes into india even now cmc valor is blessing many lives right so it's wonderful how god you know calls people and uh, chooses them uh, and uses them for missions and for building his kingdom all right so let's just close uh in prayer we will pick up from tomorrow uh can anyone close in prayer Prabhakar, if you Yes, Pastor, I can go. Thank go you. ahead. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We come before your throne of grace. Thank you for this opportunity. Father, thank you for this wonderful uh, time we had um, learning about the Christian history and missions, Father. Thank you for your servants of God. Thank you for the revival of Holy Spirit in their lives so that many moments came across. Lord, they sacrificed their lives for your kingdom expansion, Father. We are so much motivated from their lives. We are thankful to you, Father, for their wonderful and marvelous lives. Lord, help us to be in that genre, Father, so that we can get that kind of uh, enthusiasm, zeal for your ministry, and we can go out and preach you fearlessly, God, and win souls for you, Father. I praise you for uh, Pastor um, Paul, uh, his life, and uh, his teachings uh, bless him abundantly father so that he can continue leading us and getting his knowledge more and each and every class members i, I dedicate to all in your throne of grace bless each and every one i ask this prayer in the name of our lord jesus christ amen amen amen, amen. thank you prabhakar thank you everyone have a wonderful day we'll catch up tomorrow thank you pastor amen thank you, thank you.